You're listening to the Gold Standard Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympian and motivational speaker, Leah Amico. On this show, we're going to dig deep to unlock what it actually takes to build a foundation for greatness. If you're an ambitious person with big vision, but you feel like fear is holding you back, get ready for some major breakthroughs. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Gold Standard Podcast. Today's guest is a superstar. She's an elite athlete, a coach, has been a broadcaster, and she is an instructor. She was a three-time All-American and a three-time national champion at Cal State Northridge in softball, went on to play with Team USA at different events, won seven gold medals with USA Softball, and she was a college coach. And she's also the founder of Always Bev. And it stands for Always Be Vigilant. We'll talk a little bit about all that today. So welcome to the podcast, Barbara Jordan. Oh, Leah, I am very oh, excited Leah, to be good. joining you today. So Barbara and I go way back. We actually were both kind of in the process with USA softball. And um, I was an outfielder and looked up to Barb. She, how, how tall are you, Barb? Oh, on a good day, five, six. <laughs> so she's this little, <laughs> small, but mighty and not even mighty. Like, I mean, just your personality, your drive, your passion, your heart for things. I mean, I saw that, I think, right when I met you. And so I'm excited to share some of your story today. So let's start first about how you grew up. What kind of family were you in? Like, was sports just a big deal to your family? No, they weren't. <laughs> I grew up up in Northridge, uh, California. I had two older sisters, older brother, younger brother. Uh, My younger brother actually played high school football, but sports wasn't really important to my family. Like I remember my sophomore year after uh, college, it was Sunday night dinner with the family. And my dad looked at me and he said, you know, when are you going to get serious about your life? You know, let's get on past the softball thing, you know, and I'd be like, no, that's not happening. Like, I love softball, you know, that's just, you know, I mean, you know, we, we played together a long time, you know, we loved it. And that's kind of like what we did. That was what we, that's what we thought about. That's what we dreamed about. So how did you get to Northridge and get to play at such a high collegiate level? If you, it really wasn't a big thing for your family. Was it just all inner drive? Was it just something you fell in love with yourself? Yeah. I mean, I grew up on a street with like 19 boys. So I played a lot with the guys growing up. Uh, I didn't get into travel ball till I was 16 years old. And just in my, my senior year of travel ball. So I played like my junior year, my senior year. And it wasn't until the summer after my senior year in high school, that college coaches started writing me. And I ended up playing like in the city all-star game or something. And Gary Torgerson from Cal State Northridge walked over and offered me a scholarship and CSUN was two and a half miles from where I lived. Uh, my two sisters went there. My older brother went there. And I was like, looks like I'm going there too. So that's how it happened. They had a great program. And I was I was really honored to be a part of it. So when you started playing for Northridge, you guys won three national championships. Tell me what that was like to be a part of such a phenomenal group of athletes. Uh, well, as you know, Leah, when you play for a team that wins, you make friends that last a lifetime. And I think that's the biggest thing that I got is that I walked in and I didn't really know what I was getting into. I knew they were good. They had won their first championship the year before I got there. And it was the people. It was just how together this team was. And all of a sudden, I just had like this bond with these players and I still have such support from them today. And I'm so like, you know, sometimes I think like, oh, what would it be like to to play at a big university, you know, and not have to drag your own field and do all those things? Because back then we were division two, but I really wouldn't change it. Yeah, I would like the chance to play division one softball. They are division one now. I would like that opportunity. But looking back, like that was exactly where I was supposed to be. And Gary Torgerson as a leader, and he was so inspiring he was exactly the coach that I was supposed to be playing for. Let's talk a little bit about that. Leadership is so crucial, I think, to become your best self, like leadership from within, but leadership from without as well and seeing things in other people. So what were those things that made him stand out to you? You know, something just so simple and people won't think that it's a big deal. He was so disciplined. And as a head coach and somebody who, you know, all these young women are looking up to, 
One thing he never did, no matter how mad he got about a loss or how mad we made him as young women making bad decisions, one thing he never did was he never cussed. I never heard the man say profanity in my entire life. And, you know, he was a religious man, but he just had these beliefs, you know, being good and being kind and working hard and having goals. And, you know, I mean, he would, we'd walk into practice every Monday and he'd have the top 20 teams listed on a, on a sign and he'd have us circled where we were. And we'd be like, oh, you know, we're number two, who's ahead of us? Or, oh, we're number five. Who's ahead of us? Like we didn't know it back then, but he always had us shooting for goals to be the very, very best. And what do we need to do to get there? And so you guys bought into that and you were following that. And is that that's something that became type of motivation for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. It didn't matter what it was. You know, he could pick a team across the country. He could pick a team in California. If they were ahead of us, he'd rub our faces in it. And he'd be like, he goes, you know, Cal Poly's ahead of you guys. You know, I mean, he just always rubbed it in us. And uh, I love that about him because, like I said, I grew up and played with 19 boys and they just were always hard on me. There's nothing like you shouldn't say because you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. He was kind of that coach, you know, like a player got up in a game once with the bases loaded playing UCLA. She hadn't got a hit in, in the entire doubleheader. And she got up with the game on the line and the player gets in the batter's box looks down at him and he puts both hands on his neck. Like, like you're going to choke again. He didn't say it, but he was like, and you know, she got the game winning hit. Like that's just how he was. And, and the women that played for him responded. And I think that's huge to know probably the athletes and and how you can do that. I, I don't know. Do you feel like athletes these days might like start crying? <laughs> <laughs> if you coach them, I don't like, know. I want to say athlete. something sarcastic to that answer, but I'm not going to. Uh, I just think that I know in the era that I grew up for, grew up playing in coaches, uh, they didn't always act the best. Uh, they yelled a lot, um, you know, specifically, well, I think the women coaches did too, but the male coaches did not all of them, you know, they just did everything and anything. And now, you know, there's a lot of guidelines, you know, protecting the athletes, which is great. Uh, I think, you know, today's players are, of course, you know, we think we're different, but then that ages me because, you know, they, they think that they're different, but we were just hard nosed back then, you know, just, that's just how we were and who we were. Yeah, it's, it is different. I think a lot is, yeah, the time you grow up in and you kind of, things are a certain way, right? And then at that point, those players that make it kind of, they had, you had to have that type of mentality, right? And, and yeah, things have changed and doesn't mean it's better or worse, but definitely different. Talk to me a little bit about your journey with USA softball. Like, was that something that all of a sudden you're like, I want to be on that team? Or did you just get invited into the program? I think when I was finishing my college career, I, I had heard about, I think the Pan Ams, it was going to be one of the first tryouts for Pan Ams. And and I thought, you know, I could do that. And again, it was, a, and that was going to be my first year that I graduated from CSUN. That was my first year playing women's ball. And I thought, oh, you know, that'd be so cool. Like, of course, not knowing anything. I'm like, I think I can do that. <laughs> you know, little did I know, like, you know, division two players weren't really considered, but you know, somewhere along the way, I think maybe by like 89 or 90, I got an invite, but back then you didn't try out. It was how you did at nationals. And so at nationals, if you made first team All-American, you were put on USA softball. And so I think it was my first year out of college. I went to nationals. I think our team finished fourth and I was, you know, honored enough to to be chosen as a, a first team All-American. And then in 89, I was on the, on the USA team. I think that's a great point to make like different eras. There were different ways that you were named to the team. I, I remember hearing at one point it was whoever won women's nationals and that's who yeah. represented USA, yeah. you know, and then like you said, okay, now if you make all American and, and so, yeah. And then eventually there were the tryouts and, you know, there's obviously good and bad probably with all of it, like pros and cons for sure. What was your experience with team USA? Like after being, you know, in such a connected group at Northridge, was it like that when you got onto team USA? You know, I've never really felt like the same bond. I think the commitment to win was the same. Like everybody wanted to be number one. So I responded to that. Like, you know, like you never thought about losing. Like when you take the field, you're only going to win. So I think that was there. But, 
you know, the, the deeper I got into USA, I just was going through something personally. So I think I never really connected and had the closeness with a lot of players. I think I felt alone. I think I felt isolated. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on the players. It was just something difficult that, that I was trying to process in my life. And I think that's a great point to make because when it comes down to it, whatever group we're part of, whether it's people at a company, whether it's a team, whether it's, you know, um, just a, a community of people, everybody sees maybe a job or a role that somebody plays, but then there's that personal side. And, you know, just when you get into the smaller groups and the people that are closest to you, it, you do, you start to realize, wow, people are carrying a lot of heavy stuff. You know, just this weekend, I was with a few girlfriends and just to know their backstory, most people look at them and they put a smile on their face and they would never know the struggles and trials and the tears that yeah. don't get seen, you know, especially you know, as women. Talk, well, for sure. And we'll, yeah. I want to get it. We're, I'm so excited about you sharing because we're going to talk about Bev, always Bev, be vigilant. We're going to talk about that. Let's go one more step first, though. Let's talk a little bit about your coaching. What was it like um, to be a coach at the collegiate level after you had played at such a high level, won national championships, played for Team USA? What was your experience as a head coach? It was good. It was a learning experience. And it's one of those things that if I could go back and do it again, I would do it differently because I think I, I was, I coached like I coach, like I was coached growing up, you know, from mm -hmm. my travel ball coach to coach Torgerson, you know, going like this with the choke thing. Like that's what I knew about being a coach. I think I excelled in teaching them the game. Like my players, they write me today and they're like, you know, we, we learned so many lessons about the game. But I could have been more understanding and I think I could have been not as hard on them, you know, like, and it's, you know, like when I played, I would never say it's not about winning, but as a coach, as much as you want to win, there's so much more to it. And I, I in my mm -hmm. next life, I'm going to go back and coach again and I'm going to do it just a little bit different. So do you think that some of the coaches that seem to really do it well, not that you didn't do, like you said, you know, the game, you were able to teach at the highest level and you maybe would change some of those things. But do, but also, do you think, I was going to say, do you think they have it figured out? But I also was going to say, if you had stayed in with, in it longer, do you think that you would have made those changes? Yeah. Cause I was, I was growing as a coach, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was growing, it was just it was, it was a grind, you know, and I, I don't mean this bad, you know, for, for where I coached at Northridge, but, you know, just financially, and like, we, we didn't have 12 full scholarships, you know, we, we dragged our own field every day for, for practice. And, you know, yes, they did them on game day, but it was, it was truly a grind. And I always say like, if I could go back and coach, I would want to go back and coach where the resources were because, you know, you look at the the best programs in the country and there's longevity in those coaching staffs. You know, I was at a school where, you know, the it's a, it's a stepping stone. You know, your assistants come, your assistants go, your assistants come, your assistants go. You look at successful programs, those assistants have been there a really long time. And that is, you know, that's part of success. And, in you know, in business too, you know, people stay, you know, everybody has common goals and there's a common understanding and a foundation. Yeah, resources are the key because if they're getting paid well, why are they going to go look? And if they're in a great program, like you said, you have all that support behind you. And then you can see why these other programs that don't have it, why it is a constant struggle for them. And, and it shows that much more that people that are able to kind of allow their athletes to achieve that high level without those resources. I mean, it's 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 pretty big task and it's unbelievable they can do that. One more thing I do want to add in you're through commentating. Talk to me a little bit about was there anything um, that you experienced through commentating that helped you as an athlete, but then you went into the booth behind the microphone to share the sport that you loved, like something special that you took away from that experience? Uh, I loved broadcasting. Like I just thought it was super fun. And I think, again, it was a stepping stone. I think when I first started, like I was like, oh, my God, I don't, you know, like as an athlete, you get to kind of express yourself. You get to yell, you know, you get to cheer, you know, you get to physically like maybe throw a ball to get the nerves out, whatever it was. But as a commentator, you just have to like smile and say everything. There's no getting the jitters out. So it was a stepping stone for me. One thing that I thought I did very well and that I took from my playing days was 
I knew the strategies. I knew the game. I could read a field. I could tell you, I could predict behavior. I could say this, this, this runner's going on that pitch. There's going to be a squeeze play right here. You know, this shift is on, this is where they're going to pitch this hitter. And so I thought that was something that as a player and that somebody that played at an elite level, I thought I was able to take that with me. I wanted to have you on this podcast because all the different things you've done, you played at an elite level, you coached at the collegiate level, right? You, you played for Team USA. You, you've been able to take that post-career. What makes Barb Jordan successful at what she does? Mm, Leah, I have heart. I have heart. I, I, I mean, if anybody that knows me, they know that it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I just put everything I have into it. If I believe in it, I'm going to, I'm just going to pour myself in. And that's just, that's just, if I had to say one phrase, I would say that's it, that, that, and I won't be outworked. You know, I don't think there's, you'd be hard pressed to find someone that's going to work harder. Yeah. And I think that that can take you so far, hard work and having passion and heart for what you're doing. And, and that it helps you get over those times where you want to give up. So let's go a little bit into what you're doing now, because I know that I read that you told me it's the best thing I've ever done. And you've done a lot of really cool things. (laughs) So let's, let's, I'm going to let you tell the listeners about always Bev, Mm. how, how you came to found it and just what you're doing with with today, All right, well, with I'll try book. not to get long winded. So interject with the question along the way. But back in 1988, this fall 2023 will be 35 years since my older sister Beverly was murdered. And she was murdered by her fiance. And this guy had just sat with my family at Thanksgiving dinner four days prior to that. They were engaged for eight months. And when she was killed, of course, it was completely devastating. And the trauma has lasted my entire life. But when she was killed, there's one thing. There were six of us left in the family. There's one thing that none of us ever said. And that is, I can't believe that Rich killed Bev, which tells you there were warning signs. And it wasn't that he was violent. It was all the things intuitively that all of us had these little signs along the way that he wasn't right. And so there's a lot of lessons in that. There's a lot of lessons for safety in that. And in 2018, unfortunately, he was released from prison. And he now lives in Long Beach, California. And I fought to keep him in. I, again, my teammates, I was in a sorority. Everybody I knew back in 2016, we wrote letters when he came up for parole saying, no, no, no. And they kept him in. They didn't let him out, but he petitioned it. And he had nuns and priests and firemen and people from Cal Berkeley and anybody that he came across in prison wrote letters for him to be released saying that he was healed. And so they let him out and it was completely devastating. And I thought to myself, I've got to warn people that there are people like Rich Lewis and others that they're not the scary guy in the hoodie that there are normal looking people that are walking around and they mix into our inner circles and their intentions are dangerous and their intentions can end our lives or a family or friends lives. And that's why I started always Bev, as you mentioned, always be vigilant. And it is, it's a course on yes, your personal safety. This is how you should get gas. And this is how you should walk through a parking lot. But it's also a lot about your intuition because your intuition serves one purpose in life. It doesn't talk to us every day. It doesn't say, hey, 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 never talks to us until there's something out of the ordinary. Maybe it's the way someone spoke to you. Maybe it's a look that somebody gave you across the room. Maybe you walk outside of your house, there's a car across the street and you just get a weird feeling like they don't belong. See, your intuition will keep you safe if we listen to it. So I'm a big believer in that. And do you think that that, um, goes for people that will do violence or any type of um, offense. I mean, to me, like when you're talking, I think of like somebody that had been kind of family friends with extended family of ours. And I just, this man, he was an older man and everybody loved him and thought he was mm-hmm. so wonderful. And in my spirit, I just was like, mm, I don't want my, I don't want my kids around him. 
You know, would you say that it's it's stuff like that? And absolutely, just you need to that? absolutely, it's stuff like that. I say in my classes all the time. I put all these different things up, like uh, he's so funny, he's a nice guy, he's great, or hey, I could walk you home. All these different phrases. Which one of those phrases says that you can trust somebody? And the answer is none of them. None of them. The only way you can trust somebody is if you get to know them. And so oftentimes, specifically as women, we'll say, hey, that guy over there gives me a bad feeling. And somebody else will say, well, what'd they say? You know, what'd they do? And, you know, you say nothing. I just have a feeling. And so my sister, Bev, has an identical twin sister, Karen. And Karen, the entire time Bev was engaged, she says these words, I never liked him. I could never put my finger on it. But there was just something about him that I didn't like. Oh, there it is. That's intuition. And um, there were many intuitive signs along the way that we disregarded. And I believe that intuition can save your life. You probably saved your kids, you know, from something. And I, I think your intuition is always right. And if we listen to it, we can, like I said, you can keep your kids safe, you can keep your friends safe, and you can keep your family safe. So if you were to go back, you know, 35 years, like you mentioned, what would you do differently in this God, situation speak now up. knowing? I would speak mm. up, Leah. I There were things so subtly, so subtly. Like, first of all, uh, Rich told us what he wanted us to know. And that's what a lot of these pretenders do. They're like, I'm working on my, all true. He's working on his third master's degree. He served in the Marines. He has a great job in aerospace, drove a shiny SUV, personalized license plate. So, you know, those are all the things he wanted us to know. But there were many things he, he had in his life that we learned after the fact that we didn't know. He had already, by the age of 30, been married twice, divorced twice. His ex-wife and son fled in the middle of the night for their safety because they called my mom afterwards and told me, like, but because we just believed what was put in front of us, that's what we looked at. So here's just a, a, I always say, whenever you say something like this, like, that's weird or, huh, that doesn't make sense. That's your intuition. And so one day after college, I had my alumni game. It might've been my very first year or second year. And my sister and Rich showed up and Rich had a camera because back then, you know, we didn't have cell phones. Rich showed up with some big fancy camera and Bev said, Rich is going to take pictures of you today playing in your alumni game. And I was like, that is so nice. Oh my God. You know? So anyways, I play in my game. A couple of weeks later, I'm over at her apartment and she goes, here's the pictures that Rich took today or Rich took last week. So I open up the envelope because, you know, you had to get them developed and I start going through the envelope and there's not a single picture of me. There's only pictures of, you know, just pretty girls, just the, the brunettes on the team, whatever it was, close ups of women's legs and close ups of their faces. And I remember thinking to myself, that's so weird. Like, I expected to see at least one picture of myself in that since he came that day to take pictures of me and my alumni game. But I never said anything to Bev. I never was like, hey, Bev, this is super weird. I never said anything to Karen. Hey, Karen, this is like, I didn't say anything. And so what would I do now? Well, let me tell you what I do now. Now, when something's wrong, I speak up and I don't care if I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. I speak up. I mean, I've had friends that have gotten married that have gotten mad at me a week before their, their wedding. Their guy is picking up on somebody in a bar at Monday Night Football. And I tell my best friend that and she's mad at me the rest of her life. And I say to you, you think she's got a happy marriage? You know, I'm like, I tried to tell you, like, that wasn't normal. You don't do that if you're in love, you know, a week before mm -hmm. your wedding. But I would definitely nowadays I speak up and I teach other people to speak up because it can save you from even if it's not violence, it can save you from so much trauma. I think speaking up is huge. You mentioned that. And I think when people get nervous, scared, fearful, worried, or they uncomfortable, like you go silent, right? Yeah. So I hearing you say that, I hope that all these places you're going, and I want you to tell people some of the places you've been able to go, because I know you're making a difference on college campuses and corporations. But, but that speaking up piece, I was, I remember being in high school and I was at, um, I don't even know, let's say like a sizzler, <laughs> this dance. And I'm in this like, you know, formal kind of like dance, dress. And this gentleman comes up 
behind me and make some comment about what I'm maybe wearing or not wearing underneath my dress. And I froze and I froze and I didn't even get a, a look at the guy. And I went and sat at the table and my boyfriend, cause I was up, you know, getting the food by myself at the salad bar. And my boyfriend was like, what happened? And I, I just couldn't even talk for a minute. And then eventually when I, by the time I said it, I had no idea. And I'm like, why didn't I just immediately turn around and say, get away from you, you know, get away from me, you creep and expose. But Mm -hmm. they, these people must know because I just, I just went silent. And so I want to ask you, well, yeah, first of all, tell us some of the places that you have been able to share. Uh, Well, just this past year, I'll just do 2023. uh, I got to speak to Los Angeles Unified School District teachers and administrators about preventing violence in schools, which is a little bit of a different ballgames of your of your everyday life. But it's the warning signs for these young kids, you know, being bullied or active shooters, you know, what are the warning signs for that? I got asked to go to the University of Idaho after the four students were tragically killed. And I did a presentation not only at the University of Idaho, but also at Washington State, where the man was arrested being accused of those killings. So I mean, that was that was a big honor for me. I felt great about that. And then recently I was asked to go to FedEx or corporate office and I did their safety day and that streamed internationally. I think we hit seven countries. Plus I took care of their, you know, their, their, their employees that were there. And, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, and people think like, oh, safety, like I I need safety, but really like, no, it's hard to get people to go to a safety class because, you know, we, we all think like, oh, we're going to be okay. (laughs) We always cross our fingers like, oh, we'll be okay. But really like what, how I do it and what I do, it's not about like now when you park your car, this it's very audience interactive. Like I bring people out of the audience and I say, come up here, who's getting gas on their way home. Come up here. This is the gas pump. And so we have a ton of fun. And as you can see, I'm super passionate about it. What a surprise. And it's, it's really fun. Like it's actually a fun class, but the seriousness, the tone of it is always there because it is about safety. And I just teach people what the warning signs are, you know, and the subtle ways that you can position your body to stay safe. Like you are getting gas, you know, and someone over here is giving you a bad feeling, take the pump out and put it here between you and that other person. So at least now you have a little barrier, like if they did make a move, they can't come right at you. The pump is in your car and you're on the other side of the pump. So it's just kind of like head smart things that I've learned over the year. My consultants, I have I have five excellent consultants that have spent years in the military and law enforcement. And if I do come across something like I'm like, hey, that's a great question. I go right to them and I say, what's the best way to handle this situation? So I'm always trying to educate myself with the with the safety skills that I pass on. Do you find that people walk away and they're like all of a sudden, oh, I didn't even know I needed to be aware in those situations. Mm -hmm. Do you find that? Yeah, I think, you know, what's interesting to me, like on Instagram, it's not about for me, like how many likes I get. For me, it's about who liked what I posted. Mm -hmm. So if I do a post on like the other day, I did just a short video on if you're a woman living alone and a worker comes to your house, do this. And then I show like eight clips of caps and big jackets and beer bottles, whatever, all these different rooms to make it look like more than one person lives there. And I did a class, University of Washington Panhellenic this fall. And one of the people wrote, I would never have thought about this. This is great. And so that that comment and that one like to me means more than if I got a thousand likes. Like if I can help one person stay safe and avoid trauma. It's a great day for me. It's a great day. What's the biggest thing you would say that you do to stay aware Mm -hmm. wherever you're going? You travel a lot and you're in a lot of different places and unknown places. So what's something that just on a day-to-day basis that you make sure you're aware of? I think I'm like, like anybody else. Like, I think I have excellent awareness. I think ever since what happened to my sister, I watch people all the time. You can learn so much when you watch people. And again, I don't watch them with hard eyes. I just look and I process. And, you know, when you look people in the eyes, like whenever I walk by somebody, I never look down. I look everybody in the eyes. And when they look at you back, if they, if they're bad in their core, 
I'm telling you, like as a woman specifically, your stomach will tighten, your stomach will turn. Like I've walked by people before, whether I'm on a walking trail and, and I'm like, oh my God, they've like, they've been in jail, you know, they've killed their, they're, they are bad. I could feel it in my bones, you know? So I think eye contact with people is big, but I do all the reminders just like you would do if you were traveling. Like, you know, do I, do I park my car and I'm like, oh, I got to look at this, my phone really quick. And I go, you realize you're in your car and you're looking at your phone. And I'm like, are you, and I just go like this and I double check and make sure my doors are locked and I'll give a quick look around my environment where I should be doing that is outside of my car. You know what I mean? Because people don't realize like, Areas of isolation, you know, your car is one, riding an elevator is one, going on a running trail by yourself is one, like sometimes our most common and and sometimes our favorite environments are areas of isolation. I, I tell all the young girls in the, in the classes, I go, I'll have like all these examples and I'm like the beach and I'm like, mm, the beach is not a scary environment. I go, especially at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, I go, but you go down to Malibu and you go to Duke's at 1030 at night and you meet somebody and they say, want to go for a walk on the beach? Mm -hmm. That's when the beach is. That's when the beach is dangerous because nobody's around and nobody's going to hear you scream. And people know what they're doing. Like these predators know exactly what they're doing. It's why like at a party, they say, want to go outside? <laughs> why? What's wrong with that side? Can't we talk inside? Like they want to move you to areas of isolation. They know what they're doing. And we have to be super smart. When we go off away from where, where we're pe other people are around, we have to really trust the person that we're with. And if we don't, we have to have a plan. You know, you have to know to keep your distance. You should have, I always think you should have something with you. You should know what you're going to do for a what if moment. And it's not about being scared. It's just, there are some bad people in this world. And if they do try something, like I always say, what's your plan? You know, what's your plan? You're going to travel a lot. You got this big travel schedule coming up. What's your plan when you arrive at in a city that you're not familiar with at 1130 at night? Are you renting a car or are you take an Uber and Lyft? Oh, you take an Uber and Lyft? That's super scary. Let's not take ride from a stranger's. Where do you sit in the car? What do you do? How do you know if this is your Uber or Lyft driver? So those are all the things that we talk about and always Bev just to make sure that the decisions we make are the very best ones to keep us safe. And so it doesn't scare people. It empowers people. Because for me, empowerment is you look around and there's nothing out of place and you're like, oh, I feel safe. This is great. Let's go. You know, whatever it is, I feel safe. You're at a Dodger game and you look around and you're like, great, great crowd. Everybody's super fun. Or you're at a Dodger game and this guy and this guy over here are super drunk and they're starting to yell at each other. That's your cue to possibly remove yourself right now or go get somebody to help. It's not your job to interact. But I always say avoid violence. When you see something starting to brew, get out of there. Because in today's world, you don't know what can happen. Yeah, I think that's so good and such a great reminder for all of us. I think of a couple of things when you're talking. Uh, I had to, I was forced to take an Uber, like two and a half hours in the middle of the night and I, from Chicago to oh meet up with God. this family that was going to then pick me up at this hotel. And, I, you know... I kind of felt like I didn't have a choice. I mean, I guess I did. I could have just said, I can't make the event tomorrow, right? There were no more fl flights. I tried to rent a car. There were no cars. I it kind of got to the last option. My husband, of course, did not like it at all. You know, I was on the phone with him <laughs> the whole time. He had my location, tried to definitely be as, as safe as possible. And it ended up being okay. But, I, you know, I, I definitely, it was not ideal. And I, yeah. I, you know, really tried not to do those kinds of things. It was kind of a, a situation. And then I also think about, I was in, uh, my husband and I had driven up to San Francisco and it was winter. It was for our anniversary and just took this long drive all the way up and we parked. And, you know, it's funny because I, for 10 years, I would go out locally here to a park and feed homeless and, and, and people that are down and out and got to build relationships with these people. And it, and you talk about intuition. Like I just, I didn't, I felt like I knew them. I feel like, oh my gosh, these people would protect me. Like I just kind of went with that gut feeling. I feel like if I had felt different, I would have been out of there. But this situation, we pull up and it's dark and there's just a lot of um, tents and, and my husband got out of the car and I'm like two buildings down. And I just was like, I'm getting out of the car. Like, I don't know. I just was like, I don't want to stay in here by myself, you know? Well, our car ends up getting broken into. And of course I'm like, why didn't I stay in the car? 
<laughs> like, you know, we had to drive back from San Francisco all the way back home. All of my husband's work stuff stolen and it ended up being terrible. But it could have been worse, right? If something would have happened to me personally. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate, I really appreciate, you know, all that you're doing. You know, I had a question come up in my mind when you were talking. Do you think if you had said something to your sister, would would she have received it? Do you think she had those concerns inside of her about Rich? Yeah, she knew. In the end, she knew. Because I, I actually have a podcast. It's called Always Bev the Ripple Effect. And season one, I tell the story. And I go back and I interview her friends from, you know, 35 years ago now. And in that story, there's intu- intuitive signs. Somebody says, it was the way he picked me up and he'd twirl me. I got this terrible feeling in my stomach. Another one said they were driving in a car once and he goes, let's go off, off, let's go off road riding in Malibu. And they were like, oh, like, you know, like there was just these weird things that didn't add up. And of course, nobody told, you know, then nobody really told her. But I think that I know from the interviews in the end, Bev knew in the end, she knew her money was gone. He said, Oh, you've re- the, how he ended up getting her to the area of isolation that day. And Bev was just strong, you know, like she knew she actually got a phone call. She worked at the family business and she got a phone call that day from the bank saying her, her, uh, her check bounced. And she's like, that's, you know, like, that's impossible. And they're like, no, you have no money. And they ended up living together because he said, you know, we're going to be married. We should live together. And, you know, we're going to be married. We should have joint bank accounts. You know, we should be married. We should do life insurance policies, which is really what he killed her for. And she she left work that day. She went to walk out the door at 430 in the afternoon. And my mom goes, she was so mad. And she flung the door open. And my mom said, wait, Bev, I'll walk with you. And Bev just kept going. And that night she questioned him and she goes, where's all my money? And he said something to the effect, uh, the police officer say that, that he said, well, now you've ruined the wedding surprise. I've bought us, I've bought us a place to live. And if you come with me tomorrow, I'll show you where it is. So the next morning he got in her car, he goes, you follow me. She got in her car. They went up some windy pass in the San Fernando Valley to Santa Susana Pass. He got out of her car. And when they found her in her car, she had a list. You know, what is this? What is this? What is this? You know, she knew. And I think she was going to leave him. And I think he called her. You know, she called him on it. But unfortunately, she did it by herself. And had she had she told my parents one thing you know, they would have got her the heck out of there, but she wanted to do it on her own. And, and that's my advice to everybody today. You know, if you're going to break up with somebody and you're scared, you know, whatever, do it in public, do it when people are around, don't put yourself in a one-on-one in areas of isolation, because, you know, if they are a monster, anything can happen. And, and some of these guys, you know, they are not going to be, you know, found out by a woman. You know, they're not going to be left by a woman beca- and and they kill women because of it. They're not going to lose. And, you know, my, my whole thing is about prevention. Let's not let these type of people into our lives. Let's do the work beforehand before we ever let them into our inner circle. Wow. That's a lot of great stuff you've shared today. Mm, and thank you. I know that you're, impact, you're impacting so many people of all ages. I love that you're working with college athletes and students, and then you're able to go to corporate events. And I'm sure I hope that you get asked back because I'm sure people will come and then they'll tell everybody else, oh, you need to come to that class <laughs> next time. And um, the gold standard, it really is about doing everything with excellence. And I think you talked about it in the beginning of the show. You said your heart and the, and the work that you put in, nobody's going to outwork you. And I think when you can combine those two things with something that you are so passionate about, you're going to do it with the best of your ability. And the results are going to be like your podcast says the ripple effect always Bev is the podcast, the ripple effect. So people need to listen to that, especially if, you know, they want to learn more about being safe and learning how to protect yourself from violence. Is there anything that you would just want to leave with the listeners about the gold standard and doing everything with excellence and just overcoming challenges? Because what when I listen to your story, Barb, what I see is this beautiful redemption in some way. Obviously, you can't bring your sister back, but you're going out and you're making a difference. And like you said, you're saving others lives 
by telling them the story of your sister. So what's something that you would just could leave with our listeners today? I think that if somebody out there has suffered trauma, I think it's, it's I know it's, it's extremely difficult and you got to do the work to try to find a place in this life where you can move forward. And if you do the work and you can surround yourself with support, you know, you can, you can make a difference in this world. You know, you can, you can find joy, you know, and, you know, I just say like, I know, like when I was in college, those were super, super happy days. And I, and I've had some, you know, I've lived a really, really good life, but I've never quite had that joy because of the trauma, you know, that I went through, but it doesn't mean life is over. You know, it doesn't mean that like we can still be good and life is hard. You know, like my story, like I promise you, there's people out there that have a worse story than my family story. You know, bad things happen, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, a death by a disease or anything like that. It's hard on people, but we have to find the resources to move forward. And if people don't find those resources, maybe we can help them find those resources so they can move forward. So how can people find your uh, podcast. I, I think it's probably on all podcasts, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's on all the platforms, always Bev, the ripple effect. And season one is the story of my sister and the rest of it. I, sometimes I interview victims. Sometimes I bring in safety experts, talk about sex trafficking, you know, what are the warning signs, things like that. I'm on Instagram on always underscore Bev, same with Facebook, uh, LinkedIn is Barb Jordan. Uh, but yeah, no, just if anybody ever questions, you know, reach out, but I do want to say, Leah, that I'm I'm super thankful that you had me on on this episode and you are a gold standard. And I want to tell your listeners one vision I have of you as a player before you went on to be a, a three time gold medalist in the Olympics. And we were playing at a sports festival and I was in center and you were in left and it was a key part of the game. And you were you might have been in college or just out of college. I can't remember, but you were you're were so young. And the ball was hit to left center and you went running over and you laid out and you made this diving catch and you kind of like thumped when you, when you caught it and you were like, boom, and you got up and you threw it in and I ran over and you had this like astonished look on your face and I high-fived you and you looked at me and it was like a big moment in the game and it was super dark because, you know, the fields back then <laughs> were not very good. And I just remember it being really dark and everyone cheering and you looked at me and you said, that's the first diving catch I've ever made. And I just looked, I just thought my, to myself, what a great moment for her to make to make her first diving catch. And so I thought, you know, I'd let everybody know, you know, like there's always moments to grow and you probably just built on that, you know, and just carried yourself on to a great career. So I think that's awesome. And I think, uh, you know, I'm just thankful that you wanted to hear my story and share my story today. You uh, did a nice job interviewing me. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. That's so funny. I tell so many people about how many times I would crash and burn, how long it took me because I didn't play outfield until college and I was a first baseman and a pitcher. So just yeah. the timing. So I probably caught a few in practice that it, I still probably <laughs> crashed. And, and I think it got a little bit smoother every time after that you make that one and <laughs> you finally transition. But no, I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and I don't even remember that moment. Right. But I do remember being able to play with you and the older athletes that had that imp impact on us younger athletes. And I think that's what it's about. It's, you know, new people come into the fold and how do we, how do we bring them in? How do we help them to become their best while we're still striving to be ours and be that example? And so um, you've done that in a lot of ways. You've done that, uh, you know, in broadcasting, you did it on the field, you did it as a coach, and now you're doing it for really just a very important purpose. So thank you so much for sharing your story today. Yep. Thanks so much, Leah. All right, everyone. Thank you again for listening today. I hope that you're able to just take some of the things that Barb talked about as she really honors her sister, Beverly. And so many years ago was taken just in a tragic way, but Barb is able to now go out and, and make a difference. And she's used her platform and her passions to just keep growing as a person. And just a reminder to all of you that all of you have the opportunity to overcome anything you've been through, to be that leader that you, you're you capable of. And so I just want to encourage all of you, live out the gold standard, choose to have heart, choose to give hard work and don't let anyone else outwork you and you will see yourself making a difference in your life and in the lives of others. So we'll see you here next time on the gold standard podcast. 
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Gold Standard Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with a friend. You can post on social media and tag at Leah20USA or use hashtag Gold Standard Podcast. Make sure you also subscribe so you get notified each week as a new episode releases. You can subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We appreciate your reviews as they help encourage others to listen in. Until next time, live out the gold standard and keep turning your goals into reality.